Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, in honor of Blood Cancer Awareness Month, our talk will focus on blood cancers and the new research and treatments giving patients hope. I'm joined by three leaders in the field, including special guest, Dr. Gwen Nichols, Chief Medical Officer of Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in New York, Sarah Quinlan, Chief Program Officer of Lymphoma Research Foundation in New York as well, and Anne Quinn Young, Chief Missions Officer of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation in Connecticut. So thank you all for joining us. This is just wonderful to have you. I'm so honored and, and I'm looking forward to going away from this discussion far more educated uh, than I am. Uh, so Gwen, we're gonna go to you and I just wanted to uh, sort of set you up just under 40%, 40%, 40% of Americans will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. So I'm still stunned by the statistic. I have to repeat three times. Blood cancers account for about 10% of all new cancer diagnoses in the United States. That's a 1920, uh, 2021 figure. And 9.5% of all cancer-related deaths. Uh, and, and, and so... Um, continued research is a matter of daily survival. So, Gwen, as a, as a physician and researcher, you've dedicated your career to finding cures for cancer. Could you just start by explaining to, to me and to our audience what blood cancers are? Well, I thank you for that question because it is often a, a confusing area. Um, it's very different than saying breast cancer or lung cancer, where you can point to a part of your body and know uh, that's where the cancer is located. Where there is blood, there is cancer in a blood But cancer, there's blood right? everywhere. And so, it, you know, the blood cancers are very different than the solid solid tumors, uh, both in terms of how we stage them and, and where they show up and how they show up. Um, if you think about a meat bone in the refrigerator, the marrow is uh, usually fatty and solid, but in, at 98.6, it's liquid, almost like blood with fat droplets in it. And that exists in many of our bones as a factory for all of the blood cells in our body. And many people aren't aware, but we completely reproduce our blood system normally um, within, you know, some of the blood cells within a week, we have to completely replace all the cells. So it's an amazing output. And it's sort of surprising it doesn't go wrong more often. But what happens in the marrow is that if there is an abnormality there, those cells can travel to uh, everywhere the blood circulates, but also to the lymph nodes, because the lymph nodes in our body have... Um, a type of white blood cell in them. So the blood cancers are cancers that derive from the bone marrow, but that can show up um, in the marrow itself, in the bones, uh, and in the lymph nodes or in the blood. So a very, it, it's about where it starts, not where it shows up. So in, in a sense, you're talking about the, um, the, the system that enables our life is also attacking our life simultaneously, right? The, 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 you have this issue where you cannot just, through surgery or through some um, major intervention, that you shut down that system or you ameliorate it or you cut it out. You, you have no choice. You have to don't have be in dialogue with, the, with your life's blood, but also your life's blood might be um, attack your body in, in, in various ways, right? And it explains many of the symptoms that people have because it affects your normal blood making capacity. And so anemia in particular, your red blood cells are often affected by these cancers because they are crowding out your normal cellular production. And I really appreciate you mentioning immunosuppressed patients and COVID because I'm sure Sarah and Anne both agree um, our patient populations are still at risk uh, for COVID and COVID complications. And so um, because the type of cancer affects their immune system, which is your blood forming cells, um, these patients are still at risk. So I'm going to go to, to you, Anne. Anne, um, how does 
how do the, the symptoms, uh, if you look at multiple myeloma, how do the symptoms initially manifest themselves? How, how do I become aware that I might actually be suffering from blood cancer? Like sure. So multiple myeloma specifically is a cancer of the plasma cell. So as Gwen was mentioning, there's a lot of different types of blood cells. And so a lot of different cancers. I think I couldn't even guess how many leukemias and lymphomas there are. And even with multiple myeloma, it's considered one disease, but it's thought to have many, many, many different subtypes. So it's a cancer of the plasma cell, which is part of your immune system, which typically helps you fight off infection. Um, but these are bad plasma cells. They're malignant plasma cells. Um, and the symptoms are, you know, some, some uh, Gwen was touching upon some of them, low blood counts. And how does that manifest? Anemia, patients are tired. Um, more, more prone to infection. Um, the um, myeloma cells are in the bone marrow, as, as Gwen was describing, crowding out healthy blood cells, also destroying the bone. So very often we see patients presenting with a fracture, with rib pain. I can't tell you how many stories I've, I've heard of someone picking up their groceries and breaking multiple ribs or doing a simple workout. So for those reasons, especially when um, patients are atypical, um, the median age of diagnosis for myeloma is about 69, 70. It tends to affect more men. It it's in, there's a greater prevalence in the black community as well. So when you have patients who may not fit some of those um, demo or fit into some of those demographic groups, it's often misdiagnosed uh, with you know muscle pulls and, and and all kinds of other things. So it's like many cancers, honestly. There's they're very vague symptoms. But with myeloma specifically, especially patients who may be at higher risk, really encourage them to get their physicals because there's something called your M, monoclonal protein that shows up in your, or actually it shows up in your blood, but at the very, at um, your physical, your physician should be at least checking your protein levels and as well as your, your blood, your normal blood counts. And if you start to see those up, then be referred to a hematologist and get the proper diagnosis. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, and Sarah, I'd love to have you you comment on uh, on this. You've got this this uh, combination of what has traditionally been a series of vague indicators that you might have something going on, but you have no idea what it is, right? All you're seeing is vague indicators. You go to your family doctor. They're not necessarily a, a specialist in any particular condition, and it could be any of a number of things. So you know, they play, they play the odds. They basically say, well, you have a pulled muscle uh, or, uh, oh my goodness, there's, there, there's pain here. I, you know, take two aspirin and, and, and go home. Sarah, as you, as you look at the interaction between research on the one hand and the patient on the other, uh, talk a little bit about the dialogue that, that uh, goes on between somebody who uh, uh, comes in and, and starts uh, feeling symptoms, and then later on, the collaboration between patients and doctors in terms of of research and uh, funding and uh, treatments and so on. How does that unfold in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. And like Anne said, lymphoma is a blood cancer, and you know while it's one disease, uh, there are many different subtypes that uh, the symptoms can range from a swollen lymph node to you know the skin being impacted. And a lot of our conversations that we have with patients is encouraging them to uh, consider a second opinion when it comes to, um, you know, if there are, are displaying uh, certain symptoms. Uh, there's no, uh, no wrong, uh, nothing wrong about seeking a second opinion, not only from a uh, expert as well. And that's always been part of the dialogue that, you know, when we educate patients, it's a really important part. Uh, seeing an expert just can get that peace of mind and kind of expand the healthcare team uh, that, you know, will help treat them and kind of they're all across their entire lymphoma journey. And the patient is, a, is an expert, right? I mean, that's the thing. It, it, it is not this situation where you have the experts here and you have the patients there. The patient is the expert. The patient is the person who could provide intelligence on, on how those symptoms are, are manifesting. How do you, how have you seen in, in your career, Gwen, that relationship shift to a more empowered patient and a more empowered patient community? Because partly your organizations were developed 
to create that shift, right? To to create that kind of collaboration. You've you've had a you've had a long um uh involvement with the cultures of these organizations. Have you seen a change in the culture? Yes, and I think the internet has brought a change, a dramatic change in the culture because there's lots more information available in a much more um broad fashion. Um, our organizations, you know, LLS has a huge educational component. Uh, and we really encourage, you know, there used to be a set of commercials for a clothier in the New York metro area saying an educated consumer is our best customer. Well, that's the truth for doctors. And as a doctor, uh, you know, it is much, much better for a patient to come in with questions and with thoughts then hope that your doctor can get it by ESP, um, you know, and so contact, we have a free 1-800 number, you can get medical information, you can get um, a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, someone with the disease you've been diagnosed with, you can pair with somebody, there are so many ways to get help and to be able to, it's not about challenging your doctor, it's about going to your doctor and and have, asking the right questions. And I think that's something I, I believe we spend a lot of time helping patients say, here are some questions you should be asking your doctor. And I as Sarah making, said, you know, second opinions, all of that. You're making <laughs> such an important point and it, and it bleeds out into into all these different areas, right? A blood cancer, right, is connecting all these different parts of your body. And you have this dialogue with harm and health. But in, in a sense, by messaging out and involving your patients, you also have this dialogue from people who are, um, who are both the um, the victims of a condition, but warriors also against it. So you have a, a shift in power that also results in funding. Um, uh, and Sarah, could you comment on um, President Biden's uh, new announcement on this cancer moonshot and what this, this idea of a call to action that crosses all these political boundaries? He made the point that it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're, you're in this kind of condition can affect everybody. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you see this idea of a galvanizing um, march uh, of the entire country to fight cancer and, and try in the next 25 years to have the number of cancer deaths on an annual basis, uh, Anne? So, to be honest, and, and I'm not intending to be provocative, but I probably will be a little bit. For us as an orphan cancer, so we're multi myeloma is actually the second most common blood cancer, but there's only about 30 cases diagnosed a year. And my guess is, aside from all of us who are speakers and panelists, many on the call may never have heard of it because, again, it has te it tends to affect an older population. Until recently, perhaps many of those patients weren't even diagnosed, had passed away, thought they had osteoporosis, just, you know, pains of old age. So, you know, we were started 25 years ago by a patient who was atypical. She was 37 years old and there was nothing in the pipeline and very little government funding. And really, since then, we've um, very much focused on how do we accelerate a cure for multiple myeloma? Along the way, we are very happy to share with all kinds of organizations what we've done, the models that we've built, the, the knowledge that we've gained. So from, you know, from my perspective on the Biden moonshot program, right now there's very much a focus on you know, sharing what you've learned. And, and they're very much a voice too to amplify some of those learnings. So I think that that's a really important piece but the, the piece that's missing thus far is the increased funding. And I, my guess is that given LRF and LLS's focus, they may be able to talk more about that because we don't do a lot in the policy or lobbying areas. But it's one thing to raise awareness. But for these diseases that are still incurable and have limited treatment options, the funding 100% has to follow. Yeah, it starts off pretty much as a, as a messaging um, uh, uh, 
process, a messaging campaign. And if the money doesn't come, if the effort is not invested in, then it just, it, it'll fall on, on deaf ears. It, I think that's your point is that, okay, those are the words, let's see the action, right? Yeah, and, and that's why our three organizations invest, you know, well, in LSA, between us, hundreds of millions of dollars every year in research and in education to make sure, because the other thing is um, we don't want, and I'm guessing um, Gwen and Sarah would agree, what's happening now is there are disparities in terms of access to care and then ultimately outcomes. And with all of these new treatments that are transforming our diseases, it's really important that patients and the community and the entire community is empowered or else those disparities are going to grow. Um, so that's a really important piece to all of this too, is the research, but also the education and making sure the access is there. And Sarah, how do you see the, this announcement? Yeah, like Anne said, you know, it's great that we're talking about this during Blood Cancer Awareness Month because so often we hear patients call our helpline and not recognize that lymphoma is a type of cancer. So I think the awareness component is so critical um, at this point in time. And uh, for you know our space uh, in the public policy, you know, access to care and eliminating those barriers has always remained a priority. You know, we just completed a, a, a poll, very interesting. Have you, a loved one, a friend or colleague ever been diagnosed with a blood cancer? And two thirds said yes, and one third said no. But I'm going to uh, uh, bet something on the odds. I'm going to bet that the one third people who said no, it's just because they're not aware that that people are walking around with blood cancers. Is that a, is that a good bet, uh, Gwen? Well, yes, and I think that that's a testament to the fact that we have a lot of new therapies available. So you don't know when you're standing next to someone with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, chronic myelogenous leukemia, or myeloma, or some lymphomas in the grocery store. Um, another reason to be respectful, I keep coming back to COVID because I really appreciated that uh, remark. It, it really is, um, you know, people are living with their cancers now, um, amongst us and uh, that's terrific yeah it's it, it 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 used to be that as soon as you got a cancer diagnosis um and i i remember going through this also later on with the aids um uh, yeah. uh, epidemic uh, as soon as you got a got a cancer diagnosis um you began to make plans uh now you start to inquire with organizations like you what kind of treatment options there there are and uh, let's talk a little bit about the newer uh, treatment options that have developed. And if you could talk a little bit about uh, multiple myeloma and if you could talk about the last uh, 30 years of research, <laughs> because at one point, um, we, so we recruited um, uh, one of the, uh, the chief early fundraisers for the Multiple uh, Myeloma uh, Research Foundation. And we got a, quite a, um, an education on multiple myeloma, but things have changed, particularly if, if you look at the last 30 years, and then you take a look at the last 10 years, there, there's been some substantial changes. Talk a little bit about what you've yeah, seen. I'll, I'll try to do it in, in a short amount of time, but to, to be try to be as simplistic as I can. The treatments you know, 30 years ago really consisted of traditional chemotherapy. So just blast the heck out of the bone marrow, kill the myeloma, kill everything else there, as well as high dose steroids. Now, those treatments, for better or for worse today, are still very effective and still very much part of the tre treatment arsenal. How that changes in the next few years, in particular because patients and particularly their caregivers really, really cannot stand the high-dose steroids or even regular-dose steroids. It just, in terms of your quality of life, it's, they're, they're still hard to deal with, but for better or for worse, very effective. Then we had targeted therapies that targeted the tumor cell itself. Now they still had side effects, but that was kind of the next generation. Now we're moving into um, treatments that target the immune system. Um, and so, you know, myeloma being a, a cancer of the immune system, um, what these newer therapies do is basically help your immune system fight off the myeloma. And, and again, these are being used in other cancers as well. So you have CAR T cell approaches where a patient's T cells are engineered and then given back. And the results that we're seeing are completely 
unprecedented. These patients who had run out of every single therapy available, no trace of the disease for two years. Um, and so it, it's amazing because even five years ago, sadly, those patients would have succumbed to the disease. So now there's a lot of hope and momentum around how do we optimize that and make it even longer and potentially for the first time, start talking about a cure for some patients. And that idea of a cure, of, of an actual cure, uh, Sarah, Gwen, could you, could you weigh in in terms of what that means within your environment? Sarah, what does that actually mean? Yeah, I would say um, for we've also heard, you know, the cure uh, being spoken about and, you know, leaving that lymphoma journey behind um, with the especially in the lymphoma space. We've seen a lot of similar advances. There's more treatments now more than ever. Even if there's a relapse, there are so many different options for patients uh, that could be less toxic. Even oral agents uh, have are now available for lymphoma patients to as they think about kind of their treatment, their journey or landscape, uh, fitting the right uh, um, treatment that would uh, fit best their uh, their lifestyle. So I would say, um, you know, definitely there is you know, a lot of advancements that have started uh, uh, patients to kind of start using and researchers to consider that term. Um, there's still certainly a lot of work to be done in that area, but it is something that I think there's definitely hope on the horizon. We asked uh, what the top concerns are for those newly diagnosed and and why people also might be reluctant. And the the two areas that were uh, of greatest concern was the uh, was the treatment side effects, pain, and so on, um, impact on lives. And the other the other side is is costs. We're going to get to costs uh, in a bit, but uh, the treatment and, and side effects uh, piece. I think that with the greater diversity of, of treatments, it actually empowers patients to decide um, whether uh, to what. Uh, extent intervention is required and and can make uh, it empowers a patient with with more options, doesn't it, Gwen? Absolutely, and I think it it ties into what you were asking about cures. You know, there is um, it, you know, cure at what cost? And right. so, uh, you know, there there is a real benefit to having choices in therapy, and now we have a lot of them for lymphoma, for myeloma, for leukemias. Um, so that patients can say, you know what, I'd rather live better, um, uh, and uh, or I I'm going to go for the cure, and I think that really is um, it allows much more individual participation uh, of the patient in choosing their therapy and in investing in in what they want, uh, and that's great. It used to be we just had to give them whatever we could and hope for the best. I think also the parity of power uh, between patient and doctor is really important. I have so many uh, members of my family or, or circle who decide, for example, based on age, that they're not going to take uh, high intervention uh, treatments because um, the cancer progression is slow enough so that um, having that impact on quality of life shouldn't be taken. In an earlier stage, I remember doctors uh, just asserting uh, treatments were necessary without reference to patient preference. And I think that there has been a, a shift in power. It just, it just um, is, it, it improves the quality of life of, of patients. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some of these issues on finances and also on, on equity here. One of the big issues that we've had in this society is this confluence of, of, uh, it, it just becomes very clear that money buys health. Um, and if you are wealthier, you're going to be healthier. Um, and if you have access to health insurance, your quality of life is going to be better. How do we all deal with this, with this fact that cancer treatment is enormously expensive, cancer research is enormously, enormously expensive, and so often reserved to those with the money uh, to be able to afford it. Uh, does, does anybody, I'm just going to open it, open it up. Does anybody have uh, some comments in terms of first, what the state of affairs are and also how we need to change and respond as a society in order to have an America where if you're an American, you have access based in, of course, everybody has to make some sacrifice. Um, but that if, if I have money and you don't, that I, that I get treatment and you can't, 
that just does not seem right in this in this country. Sarah, you want to start us off? Uh, what are your thoughts surrounding this issue? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, for those reasons that you touched on, we do offer financial assistance to patients and our helpline does help patients um, navigate uh, other resources to assist them um, to identify uh, other financial uh, programs um, and also talking and talking them through how to address this issue with their healthcare team. That is an important dialogue that we see patients and caregivers um, when they're armed with the right questions. Um, they can uh, facilitate that discussion with their healthcare provider to ensure that, um, you know, discussing the best care uh, based on uh, their circumstances. And, and it, it, there is no shame to asking for the kind of, of support and the kind of communal response that we need to have if if indeed uh, our circumstances are not that of somebody who is uh, much more wealthy is isn't that isn't that correct Gwen? Absolutely and you know that's why all of our organizations offer that support for free uh, and uh, I just want to make a little pitch and that is that you know LLS may be known as a research organization but we also have uh, health policy research, uh, and we have uh, an arm that is, the initial RFP is to look at quality of life and quantity of life based on your insurance status. And we have some amazing proposals uh, that we've made grants to. Uh, so over the next several years, we will have some real understanding of the role that the insurance and your ability to pay for your care actually makes in, and then we can, because we have a policy arm, we can then work in Washington and in the States to help enact those learnings so that we can change the system, which all of us know is broken. <laughs> it's not helping many, many Americans. And you're absolutely right. It's wrong. <laughs> and, and to, go ahead. Go ahead. But I was just going to say to build on that. So we too, you know, have the different services that, that Sarah and Gwen mentioned and similar to what LLS is doing. We have a, a patient registry right now of about a thousand patients. And in the, in the next month or so, we will be submitting a survey to them about financial toxicity. So it's very similar to really understand, you know, we, we know anecdotally from the calls that come in to our nurse navigators and, you know, what we read, you know, in, in the media, et cetera. But now we'll have real data as well to say on, on my own patients, what is the true financial toxicity? So again, we can, whether it's policy efforts, whether it's talking, talking to industry partners, have that data to say, okay, this is, this is the impact on, on patient lives. It's, it's, it's so wonderful. So I, I'm going to have an ask for you all that, that in about uh, four to six months that you come back, because I'd like to really talk in, in greater depth about some of the research uh, uh, vectors that are being pursued today. I'd like to really get into the science uh, there. And uh, there are some other programs that I'd like to uh, develop along uh, with you in collaboration so that we can get this information uh, out uh, to folks, because as you uh, all have said, education and citizen involvement is so very important. Dr. Gwen Nichols, Chief Medical Officer, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in New York, Sarah Quinlan, Chief Program Officer of the Lymphoma Research Foundation, also in New York, and Anne Quinn Young, the Chief Missions Officer of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation in Connecticut. Thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge with us. We are in your debt. Please thank your boards, thank your staffs, thank your funders, thank your patients, thank your patients for the work that you do and for and thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thanks for having me. me.